Now we're going to look at cooling a building with passive cooling, which means not using mechanical equipment, but using the building itself as the system. And I just wanted to point out to you that in the lectures folder for passive heating and cooling, there is a PowerPoint here, um, number eight, that we're not going to go over together but I want you to know that it's here. It talks about the theory of heat transfer, the methods of heat transfer, conduction, convection, radiation, and then the difference between sensible heat and latent heat. And latent heat is what uh, is the mechanism that happens with evaporation. So I want you to know that this is here in case you are interested. Meanwhile, let us go over to today's PowerPoint and talk about passive cooling. Passive cooling works by air uh, moving across you and across objects. And as it moves across objects, it carries away heat. In addition, uh, evaporation can also carry away heat. And remember that evaporation is the principle of refrigeration. Now let's think about some basic principles. Um, and we won't talk about evaporation too much because here in this temperate climate, that's not as much of a strategy as it would be in, let's say, Phoenix, Arizona. But I will just point out to you here that it's latent heat. It's the heat of vaporization um, that happens when water turns to vapor it draws heat energy from whatever it's sitting on, like your skin, and that's why your skin gets colder. So that's kind of interesting. Works in Phoenix, not so much in Oregon. So basic principles. First principle is that warm air rises, which I'm sure you already know. And the reason it does that is because warm air is less dense than cool air. And the reason for that is molecules are always vibrating and moving around. And the more heat energy in a substance, the more they vibrate. So when air is warm, these molecules, these are air molecules here, these air molecules bounce around and bounce into each other and knock each other out of the way, creating more space. When air is cooler, as you see down in the bottom here, those molecules are less active, they bump into each other less, and they have a tendency to pack together more closely. Two other principles. Air moves from high pressure to low pressure. That's why the wind blows, for example. And it moves from hot to cold or warm to cool. So these are our basic principles that we are using to cool buildings. Warm air rises and cool air falls. Air moves from high pressure to low pressure and from hot to cold, warm to cool. Speaking of pressure, when wind blows on the side of a building, as you see in this picture here, on the side that the wind hits, that's called the windward side, pressure builds up because the wind is blowing against it. On the other side of the building, which is called the leeward side, there's less air pressure. So when you get wind blowing against a building, and especially if the windows are open, high pressure on one side, low pressure on the other side, makes air flow through the building. And that air moving, as we mentioned earlier, will remove heat through convection, and it will also provide cooling through evaporation. In addition, um, if there's an opening in the ridge of a roof, um, air will be sucked through the building, and air will move faster across the top of a building. And it turns out that Wind, um, wind blows faster the higher up you go. 
we're going to see that later when we talk about wind turbines too. So in any event, if you ha are using stack ventilation, if you get your stack up higher in the air, you'll get greater wind velocity and uh, greater air movement. But before we get there, the number one thing to do is to prevent heat from building up in the first place. And this takes us to our pyramid. We saw this kind of pyramid earlier when we talked about passive solar heating. Here it is again talking about passive cooling. And the most important thing you can do is to prevent heat in the first place. So you do that with shade and uh, so on and so forth. Once you've minimized the heat to the best of your ability, then you think about what are some passive cooling strategies you could do. Stack ventilation and cross ventilation and night flushing. After you've done those two things, prevented heat buildup, and used the building as the system to do passive cooling, only then do you think about what kind of mechanical cooling you might want. What size of air conditioner do you need? And if you've done these other two well, the amount of air conditioning you need should be small. So we prevent heat buildup with these strategies that you're already familiar with now. Uh, shade, including vegetation to provide evapotranspiration. Thinking about what orientation, what direction your building faces relative to the sun. Insulate your building. Think about the color. Uh, light color reflects heat. Uh, dark color absorbs it and then control the heat sources inside. So instead of an a inefficient appliance that generates a lot of heat, get an energy efficient appliance that doesn't generate as much heat. For shading, you're already familiar with thinking about shades on the south side of a building. And in this photo on the right, you're looking at the south side of the Health and Wellness Building at LCC. And here are some shade structures protecting the windows in these offices. For vegetation, we want to have deciduous trees on the south in the northern hemisphere so that sun can get through in the winter time, but shade uh, is provided in the summertime. In addition, vegetation will cool things through evapotranspiration. And then we want to think about what direction is our building oriented. We'll use different strategies for different climates. Unless, of course, we're using a mechanical system like an air conditioner, in which case it doesn't matter where you are. All the buildings are, can look the same and they'll all stay just as cool, uh, assuming the power stays on. But if you're using passive cooling, you want to think about where are you? If you're in a hot, dry climate, like the Southwest in the U.S., like Northern Africa, you want thick walls with thermal mass, as you remember. You want light colors to reflect the sun. You want small windows, and you want them to be shaded. You might also consider courtyards that will block the hot wind, and maybe you can have water features inside to provide cooling through evaporation. Here's the famous Court of the Oranges in the Alhambra. In hot, dry climates, you will notice that a lot of buildings have roofs that are either pointed or dome-shaped. And the reason for that is at the top of a dome or a cone, when the sun beats down, the area that it hits is only a small area. Uh, an interesting example up here in the upper right corner is the houses in Cappadocia. This is a place in Turkey where the buildings are actually carved out of volcanic tuff. This is a kind of rock that's like pumice. And people 
carved right out of this volcanic tuff, uh, carved buildings that are wonderfully insulated and wonderfully cool. Now, you will also find in hot, dry climates a thing called a cooling tower, which seems kind of counterintuitive. We know that hot air rises, but in a cooling tower, we use a wetted pad, uh, water on it. Evaporation makes the air cool. The cool air is denser, and it falls down and settles into the building. In hot, humid climates, like the southeast, you don't want thermal mass. You want lightweight walls. Uh, you want lots of cross ventilation, and you want lots of shade. Here's a building in Japan that follows these principles. Here's a building in the southeast in Mississippi that has light-colored walls, windows that open, uh, a big tower up here that can use stack ventilation for air to flow through. Here's that uh, expensive house in Singapore that you saw earlier. This is the governor's mansion in Virginia. This is a temperate climate like we have here. And um, it uses several strategies. It's got thick brick walls, so those provide thermal mass. It's got shading. It's got windows that can be opened. It's well insulated. And these two big chimneys are connected to massive fireplaces inside, which provide thermal mass. That keeps the building cool in the summertime and holds heat in the wintertime. And finally, this cup cupola up on top, uh, or a belvedere, yes, you can go up there and look out and have a view, but it's primarily for cooling. So you open these windows, air flows in through the bottom of the house and up and out through that tower. Some general strategies. We want windows that open. We want thermal mass, depending on what climate we're in. And we might want to think about the building shape, depending on what strategy we're using. Operable windows, windows that operate, allow the users in the building to decide when it's getting too hot and they want to open the window, or when it's uh, too hot outside and they want to close the window. Thermal mass, as you are very familiar, absorbs the heat and keeps the building cooler in the summer, evens out the temperature, um, absorbs heat in the winter. And it's a good idea to have some of that on the ceiling. 